Coming up next on Rugby Wrap-Up, Major League Rugby Talk with Lou Stanfield, Brian Ray, Steve Lewis, and Matt McCarthy. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by the Balanced Palette, Nutrition for Peak Performance, and the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, the world's best rugby pub. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in New York City in the United States of America, and I've got a guy on the other side of the border in Halifax calling in, Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. Brian, welcome. It's a pleasure to be back, Mr. McCarthy, to talk all things rugby. Well, Brian, I noticed that you've got a few things hanging off your uh, door there. So, uh, that's a, as, it's an advertising opportunity for some beer company or something. <laughs> Not quite. we got a little of the old... Uh, Canada 1995 classic rugby jersey up there, the uh, the ugliest jersey in Canadian rugby history. And also, new uh, player named in the Canada squad that we didn't know about before, Peter Nelson from Ulster. So just giving him a little uh, rep love up there. All right. I like that. I like that. And what I'm wearing is my American headdress uh, for you, Mr. Ray, because the MLR Championship stayed in the United States. I could have worn it last week for you, but I didn't want to rub the salt in the wounds too early. But America, the United States of America, won the, won the Major League Rugby Shield. What do you have to say about that? Not Toronto. Well, you know, I kind of leaning towards a little bit of the uh, Vancouver angle. There's, what, uh, seven Canadians who happen to contribute fairly heavily to that uh, victory. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of, of, uh, of love to up here in the north. But uh, no, we'll give you full credit. You Americans have won it again. That's why I've got my arrows hat turned backwards here. MLR all the way this week. Uh, you know, well done to the Seawolves. Yes, indeed. Well done to the Seawolves, but also you got to tip your cap to the San Diego Legion. They were just amazing. But we'll talk about that in a second. There's some breaking news this week. Um, Alf Daniels is out as the Utah Warriors uh, coach, and uh, his assistant, uh, I think it's Stevie Scott, not Scott Stevens, the ex defenseman for the New, New Jersey Devils, won three Stanley Cups. But you've also got Samu Manoa retiring from rugby on the international stage. And I think this has something to do with the Canadians. Wow. Let's, let's hope they don't have anything to do. Uh, you know, we're not playing against the Americans in the world, although we are supposed to play them in the first game. of the Exactly. DNC. So uh, here's my no theory. <laughs> here's my theory. The Seattle Seawolves who have a, a number of Canadians on their roster made Samu so happy and so content playing so close to home that he was like, I'm not going through this toil of the what that is the Rugby World Cup tour. I'm not doing it. I'm st- and, and I think it was the Canadian influence because they don't want to face him in international play. Oh, maybe this is a, a sympathy card from, uh, from Samu to Brock Stoller, his teammate who's been surprisingly left out of, the, of Canada's World Cup squad and their PNC squad. Uh, you know, just had him on this show a short while ago, you know, and here he is, he's been left out. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's the angle. Stoller said, hey, buddy, I'm missing out. I think you should hang out with me. Do you, in all honesty, and I know it's hard to take me seriously with this thing on, and I'll take it off in a second, but do you think it's got anything to do with him? Playing for Seattle rather than Toronto, maybe it's a little political thing. That's a that's a tough call, honestly. I, I it, it's because you I guys you guys don't do any of that. You guys don't do any of that stuff up there, right? There's no. Oh no, no, never, never happens. Uh, you know, there's so many wingers to pick from in the squad. They got DTH. Will they play him at center? Will they play him in the wing? Taylor Paris, Dan Moore has been in sparkling form for the Arrows. Uh, Jeff Hasler, of course, his teammate at Seattle's probably taken his job from him. So, uh, you know, it's a tough call. I would have had him in the in the enlarged squad at least to give him a shot. But uh, you know, I'm not the coach, so there it is. And in other Rugby World Cup news of omissions. Uh, France has left off Matthew Bestereau off their roster. Now, is that a slight to New York or, or what is going on there? Again, I would have had him in the squad over uh, Geoffrey Dumeru uh, been included. But, uh, you know, new guys, new faces in, in charge of France. Uh, even though Brunel is technically the coach, you have to think that Galtier and the guys behind are actually calling the shots on that one. So, yeah, big call from them. I was surprised to see that today or this week. <laughs> 
All right, well, I'm going to take off the headdress, and uh, let's continue. Hold on. Here goes that. Here goes this. I'm, I'm sure everybody at home probably prefers that I keep this thing on rather than looking at my head, listen, and the, with the scars on it. But anyway, let's talk about the match. It, it was an epic battle. You were watching on television. I was on the pitch. So we have the two different perspectives. What did you take away from this? Well, first of all, I, I just want to point out the international stream, which is what I was going to watch because I like to have the double monitor thing on the go, uh, wasn't working to start. So of all the days for them to screw that up, that was not the one. But thankfully, I did have access to the old Telemavision. So on went CBS and on went the game. Uh, spectacular show. Really, just about everything I thought was uh, was excellent. Really well done. A couple of weird calls, you know, uh, outside of the game itself. The play-by-play -play guy, I can't remember his name for the life of me, because it's a guy who hasn't done any rugby games all year. I don't, you know, uh, I can understand maybe they want a, an American voice for the audience or something, but to me it was a weird call. Why not go with, you know, Dal and Dan? Uh, Mark Strabine has been in there doing stuff all year, McCarthy. too, so why not go with the one McCarthy. of those guys? McCarthy. <laughs> McCarthy. McCarthy. Out of New York. You know, we got all, all these guys uh, doing a great job all year. I don't know why they have to, to change that up. Uh, the other thing that really, really annoyed me, and anybody who follows me on Twitter knows this, is the the stadium announcer in San Diego was just off his rocker talking all game. It's been bad all season. It was the worst I'd heard all season during the MLR final. Why? Why didn't somebody just go in and cut the cord and get that guy off the air? It was screwing up the commentary, just polluting the airways. Really strange call. Yeah, it was. I'm with you on that. It was bugging the heck out of me for the first 20 minutes that he was actually doing play by play in the stadium. And I met, I know the guy. He's a nice guy. Uh, he knows his rugby. But, and I made the point after the match to some of the powers that be. I said, this is the Super Bowl for Major League Rugby. And it should be neutral in terms of the in stadium and the broadcast in the booth. I didn't hear the broadcast in the booth yet. I'm trying to. Lay that as long as possible because I want to keep keep the memory that I have live in 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 that stadium in my head. But you know, specifically in certain instances where Scott Green, the official, is going to review stuff, and the guy in the stadium is saying, "Oh well, there's no way that Scotty Green's not going to find this as a try for the Legion because he's got all the evidence he could possibly need. It's a, it's definitely a try. I mean, there's no way he's a good guy. He's just going through due diligence. And I'm thinking if they did this in New York, Philly, or Boston, and the guy came back with a different call, the guy would need security on the pitch and then an escort outside of the stadium. Uh, it was just it was mind boggling. And I went up to Joe T. Joe Joe Talfete on in the stands, who's a San Diego fan because he's from California. And as this all was unfolding, I said, so, Joe, do you think it's fair that they're, uh, the guy is making it so that he can't, he can't possibly come back with a different call? Excuse me, sir. Do you think the, ref the uh, announcer is trying to pressure the referee into calling it a try? Uh, it's a try. San Diego, baby. you think the announcer is yeah. trying to pressure? Just a little bit. At all, sir, bit. what do you think, sir? I try. <laughs> Really, uh, really bizarre stuff. I don't understand why they uh, they let that go on. Now, thankfully, we couldn't really make out much of what was being said over the the uh, that speaker out there. It was just kind of muddy garble in the background. But uh, yeah, I, I don't understand that at all. But everything else was great. The oh, game yeah. itself, absolutely fantastic. Totally delivered. Yeah, and and I get them having that for the new fan base in San Diego, indoctrinating fans. And, and again, it's fine for the home matches. That's your cup of tea, then so be it. And, and I, as a fan, I would know that I'm going there the next time, and that's the way it's going to be. But I didn't know that. And if I, you know, if I fly to the Super Bowl and the Patriots are playing the Giants and it just so happens that it's, at, it's, it's in Foxborough because it was predetermined that way, and then the in-stadium announcer is doing it as though it's a Patriots game, that's just, you know, that's just, that's just not right. And, but there's growing pains. And, and really, after the first 20 minutes, I kind of got used to him doing the play-by-play, -play, so I didn't, it didn't bother me, except when he started trying to influence the calls by the referees. That was a little bit bothersome. But in, all in all, it was a tremendous experience, a tremendous crowd. It was jam-packed. I'm not sure what the sellout number is in that stadium, but you couldn't really see people standing in the different areas in standing room only and then they had different tents for different like little clubs uh it was jam-packed it was electric and i gotta tip my cap to the 
the Rugby 100 Club boys and the Seattle Seawolves fans that came down in a crazy mad horde and were heard in that stadium. Just tr- just terrific. Could you hear them or see them on TV? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we didn't get a lot of shots of them, but definitely credit to CJ and his crew from uh, from the Seawolves, that traveling bunch. Uh, really, you know, the cream of the crop as far as MLR fans. I mean, that's that's rugby, isn't it? That's really what we want to see is fans traveling along with the team and, and, and bringing along that rugby tradition with them. And they've been superb. They've gone to every stadium this year. So really full credit to them. Yeah, I think it's about 6,000 the uh, capacity there, Torero. So it was there or thereabouts, which is I mean, that's almost double what the uh, the final was last year. I think it was around 36 or 3,700. So really fantastic. Really, the end of the season, the last three, four weeks of the season have been really impressive attendances uh, for MLR. So, uh, yeah, really, really great signs for the league. Yeah, this was tremendous. I got there extra early. And I got on the pitch, and I was stunned about. It. I was stunned at how many people were there early. People were t- tailgating. They fixed the drinking problem because it is a Catholic university campus, but they did fix that problem. So now you can actually have a beer while you're sitting and watching the game, and that's a great thing. Uh, they had a party zone. They had it. They had it all. They had the fireworks, but that scared the bejesus out of me every single time they went off because I was standing in front of them. And because of 75 concussions, I kept forgetting that the fireworks were behind me. And every time there was a try or something, they went off. And, and it was just everybody, all, all of us over there were just jumping like that. But it was, it was tremendous. On the pitch, the speed, the, the impact, the collisions, everything. It was just, it was so much to, to witness. I, I, don't, I just can't explain it. It was just, I felt like I played. I felt like I was, I was exhausted after the match. And I was actually... And I, I wrote this. I was gu- I was simultaneously gutted and 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 ecstatic for, for players and management on both sides. Yeah, I mean, and it didn't take long. I mean, here we are thinking, you know, Manoa and Naikatini are going to be laying down the thunder for Seattle. And here's Jordan Manahera within a couple minutes of kickoff, just smashing Brock Staller. Then he made another hit a couple minutes later. Uh, yeah, you know, everything you could want. Big hits, uh, great plays, you know, great kicks, uh, drama, you know, set pieces. Went both, the scrum went both ways. Penalties won by both teams. So, uh, yeah, absolutely terrific contest uh really nothing more with you know a minute to go i think i tweeted out you know could you ask for anything more in an mlr final to be in that situation so uh yeah just a great game so i gotta ask you one question because and i'm not going to tell you what other people are saying but and i and i i just the other part of this segment in this show is the interview with shalom suniula the two-time captain of the two-time champion seawolves and i asked him this question uh Joe Peterson's drop goal choice. I mean, the guy's got ice in his veins. That could be that, you know, for most, that would be the nail in the coffin on the match because you're getting the ball back. What, what did you think? Do you think that was an ill-advised drop goal? Because he's, he's one I, of uh, like three that could possibly do that. I do. I do think it was ill. I, I, I see what he's looking at. He's, you know, he's thinking, hey, we can push ourselves out of penalty range. You know, Brock Stoller is going to send one over if we give him an opportunity. So let's just, you know, I can take this. But I think he did it, uh, you know, 90 seconds, two minutes too early. He gave them way too much time. Two and a half minutes is way too long. Give them. Uh, and he left. they only needed to try. They didn't even need the conversion, right? That was academic at the end. So I do think uh, he rushed it. They, they weren't in any danger, you know, slow going through phases. Just grind away. Maybe you get a penalty and just grind down that clock. So I do think that was a tactical error, even though it looked great. And, you know, st- I, I'm sure the odds were still against Seattle, but... Too much. Uh, there was too much left there to chance. That was, uh, uh, yeah, not the right decision for me. All right. Well, I, I, I could argue against this because they were getting the ball back and they did grind it out and beat them in Seattle with that grinding out end of the match game uh, plan. They could have just done that. Nobody foresaw what was going to unfold after that, right? And uh, the 13, uh, you know, everybody in the kitchen sink in the rolling mall to get to get that try over i was i was feet away from that with the camcorder recording it and i and i i, I still couldn't believe I, what i saw but just a tremendous match i don't I, I think peterson made the right choice staller hadn't didn't have a good day from the tee he, he, he had a couple of big key misses there 
Yeah, that's that's a fair call. And also, you know, if we think, uh, you know, maybe if those those high tackles right at the end, uh, you know, or, well, I guess, well, one penalty, but kind of two tackles and yeah. one doesn't happen, then maybe they don't get the shot. And there's San Diego's defense coming or their discipline rather coming back to bite them again, which was their bane all season. Yeah. And anyway, just a, an exciting, exciting match. And, you know, to quote the cliche, I tried to get Todd Clever to say it on the sidelines about who won today. And I tried to get him to say rugby won today, but he wouldn't buy it. He's just like, I'm not, he just looks at me. I'm not, I'm not saying that. There's no way I'm saying that. And I was like, come on. But it was great. But we got to take a quick break. And then we're going to come back. And I want you to check out some of the on-the-field interviews that we got post-match with some of the big shots. So don't go away. We'll be right back with Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. I'm Stacey Pates, and you're watching Rugby Wrap-Up been blind since I was four and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label none of that stuff influences me I drink beer because of the taste and my beer is Paps Blue Ribbon it has a taste and the flavor what do you think is on the label I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn jumping over fire Oh, that's good beer. I'm Billy and you're watching Rugby Wrap-Up. <laughs> if you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle, on West 36th Street. And we are back. Matt McCarthy and Brian Ray of America's Rugby News talking about the epic Major League Rugby championship match in san diego i'm still a little bit hoarse i got sunburn despite the fact that it was a bit hazy but uh brian as you know the cool thing about this league and the players and the management soup to nuts everybody is accessible and friendly and you know that was in evidence on the pitch after the final whistle devastated you know san diego players and coaches, I kind of, I, I didn't, I didn't want to bug them, but I got Rob Hoadley after the dust had settled a while, and, and check this out, Coach. It's it, trying to come up with a consolation phrase is impossible, but um, you guys, you captured the hearts of so many different fans out there today. You, you, rugby gained fans because of the San Diego Legion and what you guys have done. Yeah, it's been incredible seeing uh, seeing the uh, San Diego community get behind us and. Uh, you know, since we went on our uh, road uh, travel of like, six uh, games away in eight in eight games, we've come back and we're competing for the playoffs, and uh, it's grown every week, and uh, it's just been unbelievable what it's meant to our players and our organisation, and uh, we're just devastated we couldn't uh, deliver the championship for them today. So, aside from the turnaround from last year, but last year toward the second half of the season, you guys started putting it together, and you had some key off-season additions that helped the squad. But the tough task that you have is addressing the guys now. What do you say to them? Oh, I mean, listen, if you were on the field at the end and you see their faces, uh, the, the work that they've put in and the, the bonds that they've got in this group, I mean, they're absolutely devastated. There really isn't anything you can say. I mean, uh, you know, all we can do is think about, um, you know, enjoying each other's company uh, over the next week. And uh, we're already planning and plotting a way for next year. And uh, this, this one burns deep and it just means that We've got more motivation to come back here and win the championship game next year. Well, I, I know you got to split, but I just want to say, excellent year. You're probably coach of the year in the league for, for all the stuff that you guys have done. Turn the, turn the team around. Great finish. So many new fans. It was just great for rugby. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for all your support as well. And congratulations to Seattle. I mean, they're worthy champions two years in a row. Uh, and we weren't good enough today, and they, and they did it. So uh, congratulations to Richie and all the crew in, up in Seattle. And... Uh, you know, we're looking forward to a great uh, year three of uh, MLR. Well, it's a class coach, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rob Hoadley of the San Diego Legion. Thank you, sir. Thanks, pal. All right, bro. Yeah, just a, pretty much a class act. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Rob Hoadley, what can you say? We, you know, I had Lou Stanfield on last week talking about uh, the way he works with the team and his kind of player-centric approach. And, uh, yeah, absolutely a class act. And, you know, even though he didn't win, he's got to be uh, up there in consideration for coach of the year, if not the winner for that uh 
You know, he had his team playing really well and came within, you know, a few seconds really of winning the title. So there's not much more than you can do. That's just how the game goes sometimes. And it's an unfortunate defeat. But but full credit to Rob uh, for being, you know, gracious in defeat and uh, and, and recognizing that uh, it was it was a good game between two combative teams. All right. So let me let me follow that up with this. Uh, is the criteria does the criteria for Coach of the year include the postseason because it should just just be the regular season, no? And if it is, his body of work should get him that award, I think. Uh, I, I think you have to take the postseason uh, into it a, a little bit, don't you? I mean, if, if a team, uh, maybe, uh, you know, say if New York came through and won both their playoff games, you'd have to think that uh, Tolkien would be a, a front runner for it. Um, but either way, I think Hoadley's resume, you know, you look at Seattle and you could say Richie Walker, but Seattle won last year and they were a pretty powerhouse team, so pretty much expected to be them in the final. San Diego, again, strong lineup, but hey, you know, they weren't really in it. Last year they they made the semifinal, but they weren't really contenders. This year they you know they blasted their way to the top of the of the table again. Came within seconds of the title. I just think uh, when you look at the the difference made in those teams this year, I think Hoadley, uh, I think what he's done with that team this year kind of stands apart. So if I was picking right now, I would give Rob Hoadley Coach of the Year. I would too. And uh, you know you bring up the Seattle coaching situation. I'm not so sure that Richie Walker is going to be. Uh, back next year and if he's not back next year in a hypothetical scenario a situation and I asked Shalom Sanulio about this as well what about the potential of Phil Mack being the head coach there what do you think of that I would put money on him getting an offer to be the coach now the question is does he want to accept you have to think his uh, his playing career is is winding down certainly at an international level. I, I think there's one little carrot in there that uh, might be a possibility for him. It might be a remote possibility, but Canada is almost certainly going to qualify for the Olympics in sevens uh, in next month. So, you know, does Phil think about going back and giving that one more go, trying to play in the Olympics since they missed out last time? Or does he just uh, say, I've had a go, I've had my time, kind of hang him up, or at least, you know, rein back on the playing commitments a lot and take over that full-time coaching position in Seattle. So I think he will get the offer. Will he accept? Well, I, I guess we'll see. See, I, I think you're, you've got this all wrong because, A, Canada might not go to the Olympics if Steve Lewis has anything to say about it, <laughs> the Jamaican Sevens team. You're just, you're just, you know what, you're just going to get blindsided like everybody else on this one. So, and I don't know that, you know, I don't know that he wants to risk a coaching opportunity, a head coaching opportunity, if it should come his way on seven, Sevens playing, uh, on playing Sevens with his legs at the age they are. Yeah, that's, that's a fair call as well. You know, if I'm him, I don't know what I'd do. Uh, certainly, he looks uh, looks towards, like he's building towards a career as a coach. So this would be the logical step for him to step up and take over. And and really, he's been doing it anyways. He, you know, last year he was the player coach. Uh, this year, I'm sure he's been doing a lot of the coaching behind the scenes as well. So uh, this seems like the logical step for him and the Seawolves. All right. Well, look, before I let you go, um, I want you to check out the interview that we got with Vili Tolatau. Vili is one of my favorite people in the league, and every time I get around him, it's it's he's even he's even more um, endearing. I mean, and and the hair thing, I love the hair thing. And there was a security guard, and I had to do a double take, and I, and I know I'm going to get reamed for this, but I, I saw a security guard from behind that I thought was Vili, and I'm like, what the hell's going on here? But anyway, <laughs> I got video of him on camera. So, but. Check out this interview with Billy. Billy, it's a shield, so it's not like a Stanley Cup. So it takes like five people to hold this thing up. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, at least we can get uh, five people to eat off of this shield. So <laughs> instead of drinking out of it, but it's good. It's good. So last year, you were on this field, this very field, hoisting this thing with your teammates as yeah. the MVP of the match. You had a serious injury this year that you were able mm -hmm. to come back from and contribute heavily, especially in the, the second half of this match. Yes. What was this one like compared to the last one? Oh, uh, this one is, uh, you know, San Diego, they, gave, they came out strong and it was a uh, fight through the 80 minutes. So, But this one to come back in as an impact player was, uh, was a tough row. Cause, uh, but uh, it's only been my second uh, game back off of the injury. And then, uh, you know, I just had to play the game that we that uh, we was playing. So it was good to be back. Felt good. Uh, San Diego crowd kept up pumping. But, uh, yeah, 
been great. And, and you know, I'm, I'm holding this thing with you, and I'm thinking the guy just survived the rugby match of a lifetime, yet the two of us are going to have to go to the hospital holding this thing up for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's going to be tough, but I don't want to go to the hospital again. <laughs> All right, so quick skinny uh, on World Cup. Uh, you guys, uh, you guys are, you guys have a good squad. Yeah, yeah, they they got a good preparation going on uh, after this. So I think uh, the MLR guys uh, have like maybe a week or two off and uh, get back into it uh, for uh, preparation. And uh, it's going to be a big one. And uh, they got a good squad going in. All right. So yeah. after the World Cup, you have the pressure now of a three-peat. Oh uh, man. So I'm already going to put hashtag three-peat out there. What do you have to do to win a third one? Oh, it's just uh, keeping this culture, uh, building on this culture that we've been building on from the first season. So, it's, uh, you know, with the brotherhood that we have, uh, the culture that we've been uh, building within the Sea Wolves community and uh, especially the fans and uh, just growing the community apart and uh, continue on forward. All right, my brother. And uh, on forward, you can go to the party and enjoy the spoils right, of your right. success here. So <laughs> thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, you could see that the two of us were able to actually hoist the shield. Yeah, apparently they now I've heard different accounts in this. Uh, one is that they've completely replaced the other one with this lighter 20 pound version. The other account that I've heard is that it's a 20 pound kind of stand in just for that presentation. And the real one, the 80 pound monster is still, you know, sitting back waiting for their whatever it is. Anyways, he was able to, to lift that smaller one. Uh, I, I'm also a big fan of Billy. He might be uh, my favorite non-Canadian player in MLR and, and really great to see him back even though the last couple games just the last couple games after breaking his ankle against San Diego early in the season such an exciting player and as you said such a positive guy yeah. great influence I do have one complaint though we're watching the game and, and you didn't see this because you were there live but on the broadcast we're watching the play and they're talking about Villy's hair which is exciting and all that but they pan away from the play as it's <laughs> going on and spend about five seconds just watching uh, panning in on Billy's hair like come on like this you know you gotta do split screen be here you gotta do split, going on? split screen on that one guys split oh, screen amateur hours terrible oh well, i didn't see it so i'm not gonna <laughs> criticize it but two questions before i let you go the nhl last year the stanley cup went to the washington capitals and alex ovechkin had an epic tour with that cup you can't drink off or out of the shield will there be an epic Touring of the Shield with a player. Man, that would be something to see. Maybe Vili can uh, can take you up on that one, or Brock or somebody, you know. Like uh, we saw Alex Good after they won the, the Euro European Cup, or the I guess the Heineken Cup it's called again with Saracens, didn't right. take his kid off for about three days afterwards. So I don't know, maybe we'll see that. But uh, I, I'm assuming they're going to keep that on the down low if they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> Uh, and that's pretty much. I know that the the uh, I know that the shield will be in Alaska with eight or so of the Sea Wolves. They're going out and coaching some kids and meeting and greeting some kids. They that this thing was all predetermined. And I said to Shalom Suniula, you know, Tom Brady goes to Disney World. You're going to Alaska. Hey, can we get a, an MLR exhibition game up in Alaska? I know it's frozen in the middle of uh, January, but you know, maybe in uh, August or something. That, that that field is just amazing. I'd love to go see that one up. I smell, I smell a, I smell a Netflix, I smell a Netflix series on that one. All right, last question before you go: uh, the officiating, grade it for the championship. Uh, you know, it, it gets a pass. Didn't influence the game at all. There was two, I think, clear yellow cards that weren't given: the one for the uh, the tackle in the air and one for the high tackle at the end. Both of those clear cut yellow cards for me. But uh, you know, you can see that they didn't want to influence the game at all. So uh, you know. You kind of give it a pass. I wouldn't give it an A, but uh, uh, I'll give it a passing mark. All right. And on that note, we're out of time, my friend. But I just wanted to remind you and everybody else to make sure you look for our other interviews from the post-match euphoria on the pitch down there. I got uh, I got the opportunity to talk to Ross Young, CEO of USA Rugby, uh, Joe Taufete, who is going to be uh, one of two of the starting hookers for Team USA. And he was a, a disgruntled San Diego fan, supporter. Um, and also I got, uh, oh, Adrian Balfour, the happy and calm owner of the Seattle Seawolves. He was a, he was a nervous wreck before the game, rightfully so, but, uh, good stuff there. And on that note, we are out of time. So on behalf of Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News, I'm Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up in Midtown Manhattan, signing off. <laughs>